All right, hello class. Um, so today we are going to be talking about uh, another problem, so which is attitude control. So this is quite different, or in this series of lectures, three of them, three lectures, uh, will be quite different from what we've been exposed to so far. So from this, so we'll still be talking about orbital mechanics but that's not going to be the focus. So there's no, first, first of all, there's not much math in this initial lecture, a little bit of math, but not too much. Um, the next two lectures will have more math in them, uh, but the math will be not orbital mechanics, right? So if you don't like orbital mechanics, there's a, no more orbits. Well, that's not true. Oops, obits. Well, <laughs> hopefully there's no more obits. Uh, can do that. Orbits. So no more orbits. Um, although I'll, I'll temper that with the fact that, of course, we can only understand the mission design parameters that we're going to be talking about today within the context of orbital mechanics. So we'll talk about in this. Well, so we're going to break this lecture down into two components. The first component will be on uh, sort of mission design. And so then I'll give a, give us a break, stop the video, start another video. And after the break, we'll be talking about uh, how mission design parameters influence uh, the, the problem of ADCS, ADCS. So ADCS stands for Attitude, Dynamics, and Control, with a little system add there. System. So that's how the spacecraft orients itself in space, how it determines its orientation, and then uh, ultimately at the end we'll talk about control of that orientation. Uh, modern spacecraft are, most modern spacecraft are primarily um, three-axis stabilized, uh, but we'll actually be spending quite a bit of time talking about spinning spacecraft as well as another attitude control system. Um, all right. So part one, and then part two. Right, so uh, the, these next three lectures will, will cover a variety of topics. Um, the first lecture that we're giving today, lecture 15, is going to be focused on uh, mission requirements and then uh, possible options for attitude control. Right. Uh, so options here. So we'll cover the, uh, the various options for attitude control, including thrusters, uh, reaction wheels, uh, CMGs, control moment gyros, uh, gravity gradient, uh, or stabilization, and, uh, and magnetic torquers. I think that's covers it. I emphasize these are the uh, actuators. The, this the the thing that actually gives you torque, right? What we won't really be talking about in any great depth is the sensor uh, question, how to uh, sensing, and that that goes under like Star Trek errors and stuff like that. I do have one slide on that, uh, but we're not going to get into it in any great depth. So that's the main topic for this lecture. Uh, so that includes here as well, right? the actuators. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll be talking about uh, the use of those attitude control systems to uh, control uh, uh, the, uh, the problem of control on SO3, which means a control of rotations, right? Right. 
control on SO3, right? Special orthogonal group three. Right? Um, but again, we're not going to get into that in today's lecture so much. Uh, that'll that'll be sort of future le lectures, uh, because the dynamics of rotations are actually quite different than the dynamics of uh, so the d rotations of rigid bodies are quite different than the rota the the dynamics of things which are, are not not rotating. Right? So it's uh, it, there's there's quite a bit of, of math involved in that. Uh, only two lectures worth though, so you know. Don't, don't be too too upset. Um, so that'll when we get into that, we'll talk about rotating rate frames of reference and the and the dynamics and Euler's equations and things things like that. So I expect this lecture will go relatively quickly as as these things go because there's not too much math to get bogged down in, so I don't have to explain the equations to to any great extent. But we'll see how it goes. So we'll start at the beginning, right? In the beginning, uh, there was Sputnik. Dun, 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 dun. Right, and there we're getting the Sputnik. Sputnik 1, first satellite launched into space. It um, really had not much purpose, right? It was just to, to say, hey, we were here first. Uh, but uh, it did do the one thing, uh, which was uh, give out a ping. Um, I, I think it actually maybe sent out like uh, the the time of day or something. I forget. I forget exactly what it, it sent out, but it didn't do much. It just broadcast this ping, right? So its mission was to ping. Right. So it didn't require a whole lot of in the way of uh, attitude control. Uh, because it was just like floating out there and uh, and pinging, and you don't need a whole lot of attitude control to ping, right? So you could like listen to to, to the ping when Sputnik was flying overhead. Uh, it was uh, the first satellite. It was in um, a 65 degree inclination, relative, reflecting the fact that it was uh, launched from the USSR, the Soviet Union. CCCP, um, right? I used to know what CCP stand stand for. Um, I think uh, there's a Soviet Soyuz Respubliki in there. I forget what the third C stands for, so uh, I apologize to, my, to, my, to the to the Russians listening in. Um, it was uh, uh, launched into a fairly elliptic orbit. I mean, as these things go, um, obviously launched from the Soviet Union, so it had a high inclination. Uh, launched into relatively uh, elliptic orbit, um, it was uh, it was was supposed to be stabilized. It was spin stabilized, right? They spun it up. Uh, we didn't know much about spin stabilization back in those days, right? So uh, actually, the uh, uh, the spin stabilization decayed for reasons we'll talk about in the next lecture uh, after about two days or three days. Uh, now we want to pay attention when we're going through these uh, these uh, these uh, spacecraft uh, to symmetries, right? So symmetries in the design of the spacecraft. Uh, so specifically, this one has two planes of symmetry, right? So if you uh, draw a plane, right, cut the spacecraft that way, right, the uh, the top and the bottom are the same, look the same. And uh, if you uh, if you cut it uh, well, I'm, uh, my three dimensional cutting is not very accurate right here. If you cut it like in that plane of uh, symmetry, right? Uh, that plane it also it's symmetric below and above, right? So two planes of symmetry. These uh, long antennae, which are which were used to send out the signals for the ping, right? Those are for pinging. Um, actually. A destabilize the spacecraft, as we'll talk about later, uh, but uh, but uh, that means it doesn't have rotational symmetry, right? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in greater depth uh, later. Right. Uh, getting it a little bit more modern. Um, well, what do, what do spacecraft do in space besides ping? Um, well, one of the 
earliest perceived needs uh, for spacecraft was uh, for communicating with uh, other spacecraft and with the ground, right? So if you may recall earlier lectures, right, we have this issue with communication with your satellites. So if you've got a, a satellite here, right, this is not Tedris, right, you've got a satellite here, it's rotating around the Earth, right, and how are you going to communicate with the satellite, right? So say you're, you are here, right, ground station here, and build a little building with maybe a radar antenna, right, that, I mean, it's a very nice radar antenna, but it can't communicate with the satellite when it's on the other side of the Earth, right? And in fact, it can only communicate when it has some kind of line of sight. Well, we could like be generous and get it out to here if you're really uh, aggressive about your line of sight. But, uh, but still, you'll only be able to communicate with the satellite for this part of the orbit, right? And that's a problem because you would like to establish communications with your satellite at all times, make sure it's, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do, may give it commands, um, download data, that kind of thing. And so this is, this is a, one of the earliest recognized problems with, uh, with, with launch, I mean, communicating with satellites. Uh, and so the solution, right, was to establish uh, some infrastructure. Right, the, the road system of space, as you will. And, uh, and the, 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 one of the first solutions were these uh, tracking data relay satellites. Right? So uh, TDRS is what they're called. Um, there have been uh, 13 of these. Right? And what they do is they put the, um, the TDRS satellites. Okay, let's see. I think uh, get, get down to here with me. Uh, so the, uh, the TDRS satellites are in high orbit, right? They're in geosynchronous, right? Geo, which if you recall is like 46,000 kilometers. KKM. Um, and so their job is, so there's, uh, there's a bunch of them. Now, there, there have been 12 of them, but we can put three on here on, on, the, on the board. Um, and their job is to communicate with satellites, act as ground stations. So ground, sort of not ground stations, but space stations. They, they, they stay above the same point of the ground. So they act as ground stations. And what they do is they communicate uh, with the satellites over here. And they relay that information maybe to another TDRS over here. And that TDRS relays that information back down to the ground station, where uh, you, you you talk to the you talk to the satellite through the ground station. All right. So it's a road network, right? It allows you to communicate with any satellite in orbit at any time uh, using a ground station, which may not have line of sight to that satellite. So data goes from the satellite to the TDRS to another TDRS back down to the ground. So this enables real-time communication, say, with the International Space Station, so we can make phone calls up there and stuff like that. Uh, they've been around for quite a while. Uh, I don't have the dates here. Let's see, do I have uh, any dates? TDRS A83, well, okay. Uh, that's, that's actually fairly recent. Uh, before that, there were other, other solutions, but uh, the best uh, solution, TDRS, uh, only launched in 1983. And uh, this, uh, th these can be used for any uh, NASA mission, right? Uh, they're still launching them, of course, right? Uh, uh, when I wrote these lecture notes, uh, TDRS K, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, G, H, I, K, well, that's 13, um, was, uh, was, was in GEO and slowly making its way to its final destination with a right ascension of uh, 171 degrees, wherever that happens to be here. Right, so maybe it's launching over here with the right ascension of 171 degrees, if this is the first point of Aries. So obviously, what are the mission requirements? What's the mission for TDRS? It's uh, communication. 
mm, presumably narrow band communication. You want to communicate with just uh, one satellite or a few satellites, and that's what these little things here are for. Um, and then there, there's communication with the ground as well. So that goes to ground, that goes to other satellites. And so uh, for that, you need fairly uh, good stabilization, fairly good tracking of your orientation in order to, uh, to point those, uh, those antenna dishes accurately. Right. So uh, these T-dresses are all three axis stabilized. And that means uh, that uh, they, they're, they're, they're not spinning. Uh, they have a high pointing accuracy. Uh, I don't, don't know the accuracy of Tidris, but it, oh, I'm off the thing. thing. Uh, right, three axis stabilized. In uh, relatively accurate pointing. So I'm gonna say, 0 0.01 degrees or something like that. So uh, so they don't move. Uh, so this is uh, you can you can see uh, they have uh, let's see what it looks like approximately two planes of symmetry. If I cut the uh, satellite that way, right, uh, it's symmetric left and right. And if I cut it this way, it's approximately symmetric right it uh, forward and back if you if you will. Uh, it's important, we'll see why, to have the, those planes of symmetry. They help you, help you a lot when you're doing uh, figuring out the Euler equations. Right? So two, two planes of symmetry in the design and high pointing accuracy. Right? Uh, here's a, uh, a, a, a launch of, uh, I forget which Tedris this is. Uh, I guess this is Tedris B maybe, I don't know. No, this is... Uh, this is a third generation Tedris. We're not sure exactly which one. It's not that new because it was launched with the space station, space shuttle. Uh, and you can see here the uh, space station, space shuttle is of course always in low Earth orbit, so it has a booster to get it up to Geo. Geo is remember pretty far off of the Earth, right. and it's folded up. It looks like it still has two axes, uh, two planes of symmetry. Uh, I don't know what all this is. Maybe this is an antenna array or something like that. Fairly high power requirements as well. Um, okay, so for, in terms of communications, well, I mean, honestly, uh, most satellites are, are communication-oriented in design, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll take that as a given for most satellite designs. Um, so the next one is, uh, is the Iridium constellation, which was a big deal back when I was uh, first working for NASA, right, at JSC. Uh, back in the day, I think that was like 90, uh, 1994 or something, uh, was me at JSC, right? Um, let's see, what was I saying? Oh, yes. And so uh, it was a big deal because it was these, one of these first constellations. GPS was already up, right? GPS, we'll talk about GPS in a minute. Uh, the Iridium uh, concept was uh, being able to call anyone from anywhere on Earth, which, is a, which was a, a crazy concept at the time. Um, so here's the Earth, right? So say you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? Yeah, let's see, there's Brazil. Sorry about that Brazil. There's South America. Yeah, I'm terrible at this. Um, there's South America, North America. Say you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean right here. There's no cell towers nearby. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no, no one to communicate with at all. And the idea is you have uh, these Iridium satellites over, overhead and uh, that means you could make a phone call from your yacht in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and uh, be able to call New York or, or wherever it is you want to call. Um, so we were all very disappointed, of course, when, uh, you know, uh, Iridium couldn't quite find enough telephone customers willing to, like, you know, haul around these big Iridium phones. Um, and so they sort of went bankrupt. Uh, 
I think at the time it was the biggest bankruptcy in U.S. history. I think I got that here. Uh, yes, in 1999, they went bankrupt. Uh, biggest bankrupt bankruptcy in, in U.S. history. They were originally going to deorbit or orbit them all because it, it does cost some money to, to maintain those orbits and to, uh, and to uh, maintain the, the, you know, the communication structure. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the military stepped in uh, and, uh, and, and, and supported them, bought out part of it. And now, so the, uh, at this point, the, uh, the Iridium constellation is partly military, uh, so the military can use it, and, uh, and partly civilian. Uh, there were 66 satellites. There are still, I believe, well, 66 satellites, right? Uh, they form a constellation. We'll be talking about constellations a little bit, not too much, right? Because, well, that's another aspect of, of, of orbits, which we won't get into very much. But uh, the idea is you put a bunch of them, put enough of them around the Earth, and even though they're fairly low in terms of altitude, meaning they can't communicate with that many people, right? So when you're low in Earth orbit, right, the number of people you can, number of phones you can communicate with is relatively small. Uh, so actually, I should be drawing that backwards. So your coverage area looks more like that. Uh, because there were 66 of them and they were distributed uh, around the Earth, right, uh, the idea was that you could communicate with anyone um, on the Earth. the sun, right? Uh, this is, of course, taken to extreme lengths and more recently with Starlink, and we'll talk about Starlink in a second. Uh, they were all in 75 degree inclined orbits, right? So this looks approximately it. But of course, the, uh, the right ascensions of those, uh, of those orbital planes differed, right? So the six orbital planes correspond to different right ascensions. Now, you can see here how it's important uh, what happens with omega dot, right, due to J2 perturbations. There's a significant J2 perturbation to these, these satellites, right? And so you have to keep, you want to keep track of that. Anyway, that's not the focus. Again, I'm bringing in the orbits, but not the focus here, uh, focus on mission design. Uh, so what do we have here? We've got a communication satellite, has to be uh, uh, three DOF stabilized. Right. Uh, the uh, symmetries, well, there's one plane of symmetry, one plane. There's almost two planes, um, except for the fact, well, I mean, so the, you, the, you could say that there's, there's two planes of symmetry. It's a little bit dicey because when you rotate these, uh, these solar panels, uh, uh, you sort of lose that plane of symmetry, but uh, we'll say maybe. The, the perturbation from that is not high, maybe two planes. And that'll affect the inertia tensor of the, uh, the spacecraft. We'll see the importance of that later. Specifically, it's, it's sparse. It has mostly diagonal entries. Um, so yeah, so it was, uh, it was resuscitated at some point. And in fact, actually, there, were, there have been more recent uh, Iridium satellites. There weren't any uh, launched from 1999 to 2017. But then in 2017, there was another one. And so the Iridium constellation is, is, is active. I suppose you can go and buy a handset and, and make satellite phone calls. Sat phones, right? That's, that's Iridium. Uh, next, we've got uh, Voyager spacecraft. We talked a little bit about the Voyager spacecraft earlier. Um, so the Voyager spacecraft obviously has to be uh, three DOF stabilized. And why is that? Well, you think about the mission. What is the mission, right? The mission here is um, observation, photo taking. The 
photography, if you will, of the uh, whatever uh, whatever planet they're 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 buzzing by at the current moment in time. And there's another mission which is sort of implicit there, which is uh, communication. They have to send those photos back to Earth. It looks like an A, not a C. Communication. All right, so three DOF stabilized because, uh, so DOF means degree of freedom, by the way, uh, because it has to, to point very accurately at what it's in, in not move while it's taking the photo. And it has to maintain that communication link to Earth, right? So here's Earth. Now remember, Voyagers 1 and 2 are like way out there now. They're like beyond the, 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 the heat. What is it called? The, um, the Helios trope or something like that. The, the fuzz at the end of the solar system. They're also out of the ecliptic, so it's not too bad. But, uh, but anyway, they, they've got to point back to Earth because they've got to communicate back to Earth. Right. So they always have to maintain the same orientation with respect to Earth because they have to be pointing at the Earth. Right. Um, this actually created a, a it was a bit a bit of a kerfuffle, right? Uh, back about ten years ago, uh, with the physicists, um, and so it was an interesting story. Uh, so. Right, we we saw those orbits of of the Voyager spacecraft. Right, and they were here's the sun. Right, there's the sun, and they like went off on their hyperbolic trajectories out here, and so we uh, because they're in hyperbolic trajectories, they're above the ecliptic, not too many disturbances. Uh, we know where they should be fairly accurately. Right. Uh, so they should be escaping, right? They should be on escape trajectory, leaving the solar system. And uh, I think it was Voyager 2. Um, had a bit of a... Uh, there, there, we noticed, because we were tracking these things very accurately, we could communicate with them at all time. We noticed that uh, their, the orbit was not perfectly hyperbolic. And the question was why? Why was it not perfectly hyperbolic? Right. Um, specifically, it seemed like it was sort of bending closer back to Earth. Right. So it was not leaving as fast as it should have. Right. And uh, there was no really explanation Right? Why? Why this was happening? Uh, because it was above the uh, the ecliptic, not much to gravitational pull, and uh, there was nothing out there that was obviously causing it to, 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 to you know, to bend. And so uh, people got into a big stir. Right? Why was this happening? I mean, did it? It was it running into dark matter? Right? like that was bending the orbit back, right? Dark matter here. Uh, were the laws of, uh, of uh, were Kepler's laws of gravity, uh, derived from gravity, failing? So this was a big deal and people like fussed with it for quite a while. Um, but it turns out uh, they, I think, I think they more or less figured out what was going on. Uh, so it seems that what was going on was that uh, change of color here because we're overdoing yeah that one uh, green. So what was happening? Actually, green uh, was already greened in here. Uh, so it seemed like what was happening was well, let, let's 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 take a look at this thing right here. Basically, what was happening was this thing. So what is this? Well, remember, for pointing accuracy, 3 DOF stabilization requires quite a bit of, uh, of energy, of electricity, right? And when you're really far out from the sun, right, uh, solar, solar panels don't cut it. You don't see any solar panels here, right? There's no solar panels on the Voyager spacecraft. Right? 
right? Because it's going really far out. There's not enough sun. The solar panels don't help. So instead they have these uh, radiothermal isotope generators, which basically have, I forget which, what the fuel thing they have. I think it's uranium or plutonium or something. Uh, maybe let's say U-235, that's a guess. In any case, uh, things break down in the uh, U-235 has a half-life, right? Uh, the, 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 the element breaks down, it uh, releases heat, not, uh, we're not, we're not creating, it's not a fission reaction or anything, it's just releasing heat. And that heat, right, is used to generate, can be used to generate electricity. Very, very inefficiently, by the way. I mean, the, the, the fraction is like 5% or 3%. It's, it's ridiculously small. But it generates a lot of heat and a lot of radiation. And that radiation is used to generate electricity. Fine. Okay, very good. So what's the problem? Um, well, the problem seemed to be that it, it's dirty, right? The radiation is a bit dirty. And that uh, you see why it's like way off here, right? The, the radioisotope thermal generator is way off here. And that's so it doesn't mess with the rest of the spacecraft. They put it specifically far away from the spacecraft to minimize that radiation effect. Well, anyway, uh, so what it was happening was that there's enough radiation, right, that these little alpha particles and are, are coming out, spewing out of the, the spacecraft, or out of the thermal generator, the alpha particles, right? And uh, alpha particles have mass, which normally wouldn't be a problem. You're spinning them all in the same identical directions, um, except that it seems like a few of them were coming off here and bouncing off the, uh, the, the, the communication dish, right? And those particles which bounced off the communication dish were not identically distributed in all directions. And so you got sort of what I guess is the equivalent of solar wind, but radiation wind or something like that, pushing against, right? Maybe my, go back to uh, something more visible, right? You got this, this radiation wind blowing against the spacecraft and pushing it because it's always maintaining that fixed orientation towards Earth. Right. Right. So, in effect, actually, or Earth is asserting some constant force on this uh, spacecraft in this direction, and that's bringing it back towards Earth. So it may be actually, if we, in, in some million years, if this Voyager is still functioning and still pointing in the same direction, it'll it may actually return to, to Earth. But well, we'll see. Or I guess we won't see because. I probably don't plan on being here in a bit, million years. Uh, sorry. Cute story. Oh, uh, what was I? There was a one. Oh, yeah. So planes of symmetry, right? So are there planes of symmetry here? Well, there's radial symmetry, so which is basically two planes of symmetry. Go back to orange, right? Radial symmetry about this line here, except for the radioisotope thermal generator, which is way off center. So really there's, mm, there's maybe one plane of symmetry, but even then uh, this, uh, the, these, the, these sensor arrays, notice that they're as far as possible from the thermal generator. These sensor arrays are slightly off axis, but maybe there's one plane of symmetry. one plane of symmetry. We'll say pos for plane of symmetry. Okay, so next up. Um, so uh, the next, uh, so as long as we're on photography, you might as well, uh, we might as well uh, continue in that way. Uh, so the next, uh, the next application or the next mission, uh, is uh, considers the Hubble Space Telescope. In the mission, what's the mission of the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, obviously, photography. In fact, if you uh, if you see some of my backgrounds, uh, this is the Enterprise uh, D, I think maybe. Uh, some of my backgrounds uh, include the Carina Nebula, right? 
And that's a very high resolution photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So we will see that I'll, I'll point that out when I I'll put that in my next background. Um, so anyway, so the mission is, is, is photography. So obviously we need three DOF stabilization. You have to point, be able to point in any direction. Um, so three DOF stabilization. Uh, planes of symmetry, right? Um, one, two. Right? So clearly at least two planes of symmetry. It almost has radial symmetry, which means symmetry about that axis. And then if you look at the inertia tensor, that means it's a diagonal entry and all the diagonals are the same. So uh, radial symmetry is great. Uh, we don't quite have it in this case, however. Uh, what else can we say? So it's in relatively low orbit, right? Uh, for the reason that, uh, well, it's big, uh, so you can't really boost it much higher. Um, so big, I guess, is a mission parameter. Uh, so it's a relatively low Earth orbit. It was launched from the, spa from the space shuttle. So something about the radial symmetry may be because it was stuck in the uh, space shuttle la uh, bay, launch bay. Anyway, it was in relatively low Earth orbit so, this, so that you can maintain it, right? You can go back. And in fact, we've been back to the Hubble Space Telescope many times to uh, replace uh, the, the reaction wheels, which have failed. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, 28 degrees, because that's where the space, uh, space shuttle usually launched to. Um, notice that there was, another, there was another space telescope, the Webb Space Telescope, uh, which was actually in the... Uh, uh, it, w it was not orbiting any planet. It was uh, it, it, it was orbiting the sun, so it was way far off. Uh, this is moving quite fast because it's in low Earth orbit, um, and so it's not quite as accurate as the Webb Space Telescope was. Um, this the Webb Space Telescope. Uh, Kepler, I think uh, we call it, uh, we can call it, let's call it Kepler, Kepler Space Telescope. Similar mission, higher pointing requirements. This was a planet finder. Anyway, uh, the problem is, uh, you know, when you're in Earth orbit, there's a J2 perturbation, there's atmospheric drag, there's solar, there's a lunar perturbation. There's all sorts of things going on. And uh, so Kepler was launched uh, into, a, into a heliocentric orbit to get away from all that. Uh, the downside, of course, was that when it failed, as the Hubble Space Telescope failed multiple times, uh, when its reaction wheels failed, there was there's no way to fix them, right? Uh, versus in the Hubble Space Telescope, we've fixed the reaction wheels, I think, two or three times at this point. So anyway, uh, very high pointing action, accuracy required uh, roughly two planes of symmetry. Oh, now we get into uh, sort of some interesting bits, uh, other applications of satellite design. Uh, so this, uh, the mission here is SIGINT. Right. So uh, the mission here, what are, what are we doing? Um, so spying, right, obviously, signals intelligence, right? Uh, so there's several purposes. Of course, there's space telescopes for photography, but that's not this. This is uh, intercepting electromagnetic communication. Right. Uh, and so in order to monitor electromagnetic communication, you need a really big, uh, you need a really big dish, right? because you're sweeping up sort of essentially what is stray radiation 
which was not directed at you, right? So there's no, uh, no very, not very uh, focused beam, right? Uh, so picking up stray radiation. Right. So what do you, why, why would you want to do that? Well, obviously, because uh, the NRO would like to, uh, to, to listen to your telephone calls, um, basically. Uh, so they, they have these really large, uh, um, uh, I mean, not just the NRO, I mean, well, most governments, right, have these? Uh, you know, Russia has them. Um, they're not as well known because, well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but uh, we, we've got them, uh, everyone's got them. Uh, they're really big because um, uh, you need that, su that surface area to get large, uh, large, large communications. Now, they don't have to point particularly accurately, right? Um, but it helps if they are, right? So you can, a parabolic dish will uh, allow, right, the EM radiation, which is coming in, focus it on a particular point, and so amplify that signal right, from whatever's coming in this way. Yeah. So these are, are really big dishes. Uh, the uh, the L32 satellite right here uh, it was uh, is is the largest satellite. I think it's still the largest satellite that has ever been launched. Um, we know it has a uh, diameter, a dish diameter of a hundred meters, right? That's a tenth of a kilometer, right? So you know, you could drive from one end of the dish to another, and it would take a while. You could walk from one end of the dish to the other, and it would take you know thirty minutes, or I don't know. Actually, it wouldn't take that long, but still, a hundred hundred meters in space is huge, right? Even our Earth-based radio telescopes, which we also have Earth-based radio telescopes, of course, right? Uh, so radio dishes, you know, you think you see those those ones in the in the in the Amazon rainforest and stuff, really big dishes. Um, those can be up to a kilometer, but still 100 meters in space where there's nothing else disturbing your, your signal, right? So we have one of those in space, and we have one on uh, several of them on the Earth, right? And so several of them in space as well. So what are these used for? Well. Of course, you can like monitor all the EM signals coming off of a city. Um, at some point, I believe uh, the uh, I, 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 reading on the web, right? The uh, uh, I think the Indian mo uh, uh, phone communication satellite was compromised, and so the I think one of these Orions floated over. They're in Geo. The Orions are in Geo, uh, and they uh, they floated over the uh, uh, the. Uh, the, the Indian telecommunication satellite and like just monitored it for a while, just trying to get getting every phone conversation uh, that, that was that was being broadcast out there. That was, uh, and then it moved back over to China, I think, because it, maybe there, all the phone calls were very boring. <laughs> I guess that was the problem. Uh, so anyway, it stayed a while there, and then it moved on. Um, so uh, let's see. In, in this, uh, so a like you know. Um, Yes, these, uh, these, uh, all the details of all of these satellites are, of course, classified top secret, right? However, what I'm telling you here is not top secret because it's in the public domain. So, for example, the size of uh, uh, of the Orion uh, uh, L32 uh, is uh, was it was actually a quote from from the director of NRO, so public quote, right? It's not 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 private. Um, so there, there's some of these that are in geo, right? The, the big one is in geo. It has to be big because it's like way out there, obviously. Uh, so it's in geo. You can, the thing is like, it's hard to keep a space satellite, uh, signal, SIGIN satellite secret, too secret because um, they're big and they're in space. And so anyone with a telescope can just point their telescope in space and see it, unless they're like painted black or something, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, the, the advanced Orions are the big ones. They're in Geo. Most of them are in Geo. Uh, they replace the, uh, the Magan series. They can be moved around. 
Obviously, you want them three axis stabilized because you want to point to something. Um, they may have one or more planes of symmetry, right? So if we go back here, uh, this has sort of radial symmetry, but it's got these other things hanging off for communications. Uh, and so uh, actually, I guess, uh, hold on, I drew this line wrong. The parabolic is communicating with this bit over here, right? Para focusing on that bit. That's connected here, connected, and then communicates to your ground station or your relay station, whatever. Um, this is uh, I think this is also Orion. Big uh, so this is a uh, um, where does this come from? The, this image. So this image is uh, I believe actually f it's like historical conceptual satellite. I don't it's, it's conceptual. It's not an actual design. It's just like idea. Uh, I believe this is the actual, this is uh, more or less an actual uh, satellite. Uh, this one uh, is in the public domain because it was released by, uh, uh, by Snowden uh, in the, the Intercept, right, 2009. Um, so there's a, there's a there, 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 if you go to like, if you go to this website here, so uh, this website, right, so it goes through everything that was released in the uh, the Snowden leak. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's the PAN satellites. Actually, the PAN is weird because it was actually acknowledged by Lockheed. I don't know what's going on. We, don't, we actually don't know what PAN does very well. Um, right. and you, see, you can see the, the, the things moving around and stuff like space because they're easy to track. Um, so that's what we got. Um, get back to... Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, the uh, that's from the Snowden leak. Here we can see again constellation of the uh, the SIGINT satellites. Um, the uh, you may notice that these uh, so most of them are in geosync, right? More or less geosync. Right? These are the Mentors and the Orion satellites. Um, you got some other ones which are the Trumpets. Uh, so so oh. I can't. No, that's not working. Does it? Okay, so if you can look at my pointer, right, these ones, these should look familiar to you, All right? Because these are Molniya orbits. These are the trumpets. USA, by the way, 259, 184. Those are, these are publicly known launch, um, uh, launch numbers, right? If you look up on Wikipedia, it lists all of the launches and presumably what they are, right? So this is, it's all on Wikipedia. Uh, cute, you can notice that most of the Orions here are focused on a particular part of the Earth. Uh, what is that part of the Earth? Um, probably Eurasia, I would guess, uh, but we're not sure. Uh, you have these, uh, in addition, the trumpets uh, in the high inclination orbits to, uh, to monitor things which are not visible from GEO. So remember, GEO is focused on the equator. And so if you want higher altitude, uh, higher uh, latitude, uh, targets, right, you use the trumpet satellites. Right. Uh, notice we don't have any uh, trumpet satellites uh, monitoring the southern hemisphere, so we mostly focus on the northern hemisphere, I guess, or at least, uh, you know, not that we know of, right, I guess. Uh, so, okay, um, yeah, the trumpets are in Molniya orbits, uh, inclination 64 degrees, uh, this orbit, which we, we talked about last time. Uh, so you can monitor at Apogee. Right? Uh, so we don't know that much about them other than like these, uh, the few things, the fact that you can see them from Earth from, with a telescope and there's a couple leaks. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, the NRO is not that, not that uh, uh, secretive uh, compared to, to some other uh, government agencies in other countries. Um, okay, so next, next up uh, along the military uh, communication line, um, uh, TACSATs. Now these are old ones, right? These are again military communication satellites, sort of the iridiums of back in the day. But they were they were big satellites, and uh, they were purposed for uh, communication between, say, field commanders on the ground and uh you know uh, hq hq 
uh, whoever happens to be fighting here on the ground and right they relay signals like that uh, these are pretty old uh, you can see 1969 you got uh, fairly accurate um, pointing requirements but uh, they used uh, spin stabilization so actually this is a dual spinner so that the top is despun not spinning that means so obviously you can't the top can't be uh, spun because it has to point to something right and it can't move uh, and these uh, these are spun so again communications but not in a constellation All right these were also in geo or geo um, this particular one uh, 107 degrees uh, right ascension I don't know what that was over um, it uh, has approximately radi radial symmetry because it's a spinning satellite. Um, now, tax sets, uh, you know, are fairly old. They're not to be confused with uh, the more recent tax sets. There are actually, there's another tax set, which is, I guess, partly lowercase. Um, so uh, the, the recent tax sets are... Uh, are, are what you, you, you see in the, in the movies. You know, these, these are sort of uh, more boring. Uh, these are in the movies, right? So, so uh, we don't know that much about them again, but uh, right, they were uh, they're in uh, relatively low orbit, not geo. And they're used for tasking, right? So that's, uh, you, got a, you got a battlefield, right? And it's real-time imaging of the battlefield. So the mission is real-time imaging. All right, so you've got the bad guys here. Uh, I guess they're supposed to be red. Make them red. Bad guys here. Bad guys here. You've got good guys. And good being all, you know, sort of relative, if you want. Um, good guys here. And it uh, tells you where these guys are going. So if you uh, if you see those uh, you know the the movies where you know, the people you're you're tracking the the combatants in real time those are the tax sets tactical uh, tactical observation satellites to not to be confused with communication satellites right so this is our mission is well real time imaging I already said that right. interesting story uh, you know illustrating the uh, uh, how some of these launches kind of work, right? There are uh, several tax sets. Uh, the first one, tax at one, uh, had a planned launch in uh, 2004, uh, January 2004, but it was delayed, and it was delayed again. It was delayed so long that actually they launched tax at two in the meantime, which actually wasn't delayed in 2006. So it was delayed for two years. Uh, they launched tax at two, which seemed to work okay. Uh, then it was delayed again, delayed again, and then they uh, they actually got through TACSAT 3 in 2009, although it did re-enter in 2012. Um, and so finally they got around, they finally got around to TACSAT 1, but they already had two TACSATs up there at that time, and the newer TACSATs were better than the old TACSATs, so they said, eh, why launch it anyway? So they just delayed it, delayed it, delayed it. Eh, it's it's too old now anyway. Let's just cancel the whole thing. Never mind. Right. These satellites are designed to have a lifespan, and uh, five years is like a significant fraction of the lifespan. Right. Uh, Taxat four launched in twenty eleven. Right. So uh, again, right? They're uh, they're taskable. Right. They uh, they can hit high latitudes. Uh, you, so you, you task them by moving the, the right ascension, plane changes. Delta, omega, right? That's how you task them. You don't change, well, you could change the argument of perigee, but you don't really want to, right? So these, these, these elements are fixed, these orbital elements fixed. Uh, but we can change the right ascension, and that's relatively easy to do by uh, slowing things down and speeding up. Actually, what you really want to change are the ground tracks. Uh, 
And so small changes in period can uh, all change your ground track. We didn't talk much about ground tracks. We had like one slide on it and one homework assignment on it, uh, but, uh, but uh, ground tracks are important. Can yield large changes in ground track. Um, again, I don't have a bit image of the tax set, so I apologize for that. Uh, next up, uh, the one probably everyone uses most often, which is the GPS satellites. Right? This is the this is the, these are the satellites which probably have the largest economic uh, impact on uh, on the United States or, or on the world really because everyone uses them, and that's the GPS three sat GPS satellites. Right? Uh, so there have been lots of blocks of them. Um, they act in a constellation, and the idea is, well, they don't actually communicate with you. They do communicate with each other a little bit, uh, but they don't communicate with you. Uh, they just broadcast. So essentially, essentially, we're back to Sputnik here. The mission is pinging. So uh, you see these, these these antennas here, right? That's uh, wait. Um, so actually, I'm not sure where they broadcast from. Um, so broad wide area broadcasts. Uh, I should know this, right? Because I actually did work on the GPS uh, Block Three satellites back in the day. Uh, with Gaylord Green uh, over at Stanford, uh, but um, so we they have to communicate with other satellites. So typically, these I think these are the satellite to satellite communication links, and uh, they they should be narrow band. And the idea was we're gonna figure out how narrow band they should be. Um, so they they actually communicate with each other, uh, and that's just to sync up their clocks, right? So. Well, if you don't, if you so, if you don't know how GPS works, right? It, it works. It, it's a positioning system, right? So, uh, satellite uh, navigation or navigate terrestrial navigation. And this is a an example of a satellite design or a satellite mission which only works in within within a constellation of satellites. So one GPS satellite will get, do you absolutely no good. Two will do you no good. Three will do you no good. But if you have four uh, in sight at any time, then you can figure out your position. Right? So if you have one, two, three, uh, four satellites in position overhead, and usually you have about eight or nine of them. Uh, so if you have four satellite uh, in, in position overhead, Basically, all they do is they ping the time of day. It's, it's like the, 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 the phone number for time, right? You, you call it up and it tells you the time of day, right? So basically, that's what they do. They broadcast time. Right. So they broadcast time. But they broadcast time, of course, at the time when they broadcast it. So the time it takes for that uh, ping to get to you right, is a delay, there's a delay, uh, which is uh, the distance, delta x, uh, or delta r, I should say, uh, times the speed of light, right? And, uh, and so, right, if you know what time it is here, right, you can figure out, right, uh, this delay, so you can combine those two to get your delay. And then you know the speed of light, so you can figure out what is delta r. What is the distance to that satellite? Right. You do this with four satellites, or actually you do this with three satellites, right? And you can figure out your x, y, z position if you know the orbital elements of the satellites, if you know where the satellite is. r known, r2, r Three, R, four. Right. So 
Obviously, you have to know where the satellites are, but they're in orbits, so their orbits are known very accurately, and so uh, uh, you can figure out, based on the time of day, what those position vectors are. That's your, uh, remember, uh, your orbital elements, A, E, I, omega, omega, F, to R, right? right? That's the, the your, when you have a GPS receiver, that's what it does. It converts the orbital elements to a position vector. It does, so then it gives uh, three positions, three distances, that's three, uh, three unknowns, X, Y, and Z, your position, R receiver. Three unknowns, uh, three equations, you can figure out uh, your position from that. Uh, so why, is there, why do you need four? Well, because you actually, you don't really know what time you're receiving this. And so uh, there's actually four unknowns. Time and your position vector. And based on the measurements from four satellites, you can figure out uh, those four unknowns. Right? Four equations, four unknowns. So incidentally, right, what that means is that not only is the GPS signal telling you uh, the, your position, but it's also giving you the time with the accuracy of an atomic clock. So the most accurate clocks you can get are those based on GPS triangulation positions, because each of these little satellites has a, has a, has a, an atomic clock on board. Right. So they broadcast the time, atomic time, if you will. And they broadcast, of course, uh, they constantly update the orbital elements, A, E, I, omega, omega, F. And so based on those, you can, uh, you can figure out, so that it, it broadcasts that information as well. But the most important one is the is the time. Right. Anyway, so you need four. Basically, you need four of these overhead at any given moment of time, or they're all completely useless. Right. And so to do that, you design a constellation. Uh, there's a uh, six orbital planes. Uh, they're all at 55 degrees inclination. We'll see that 55 degree inclination uh, very common uh, in satellite constellations. About that because it. It gets high up in the in, in above the Earth, right? So here's the Earth, 55 degree inclination looks like that. So right there. So it covers most of the Earth, with the exception of maybe the North and South Poles. So I'm, I'm I believe actually the GPS actually because it's a high orbit, 20,000 kilometers. GPS does actually will give you positioning at the North and South Pole uh, because it's it's so high up. Uh, others, like the uh, Starlink constellation and Iridium, uh, don't. Uh, so if you're, we want to make a phone call to the North Pole, or you want internet at the North Pole, you like Santa Claus or something, um, then, you know, sorry, you can't do that. So we have a, uh, an image here of the, uh, of the uh, GPS constellation. I know it's kind of small, you can't see it very well. But you can see at any at this point in uh, on the Earth, right? There's there's always going to be at least four satellites overhead. It dips down to six occasionally, and of course, if you don't have line of sight, right? There's buildings in the way. It's a, GPS is a big problem in cities um, or in the forest, right? Uh, uh, then you have problems. But otherwise, uh, generally there'll be line of sight. But the signals aren't strong enough to pass through buildings, right? That ping won't pass through buildings, so you have to. You have to be make sure you're not you have you don't have issues like that. Right. Actually, that issue uh, was is sufficiently severe that they they launched the uh, wide area augmentation system uh, for North America. So there's a there's now a geo version a geo version uh, of GPS uh, so that it can get between those buildings. So because it's a, it's, it's a geo, right? It's directly overhead, right? So here, here's your city, right? Uh, this is North America, by the way. Right? You're, you're here on your car, and there's a, uh, a wide area augmentation system satellite 
more or less directly overhead. Right? It's, set, it's, it's geosynchronous right on the middle of North America to augment those, uh, those GPS satellites, which uh, you know, are typically might not have line of sight, might pass through that building. Um, right. Uh, next up, we've got uh, the uh, Soviet version of the uh, of the attack sets. Because they would also like to communicate with their battlefield commanders. Um, there were uh, a bunch of them. There were 12 of them, right? 12. The Strelia. Uh, satellites, Trelia, if I pronouncing my Russian right, uh, which means arrow, right? I believe. Um, they uh, again, you could see they have some uh, this this radial symmetry here, right? Um, but not too much because these things are sort of lumped together, um, and so actually they're not uh, they're not spin stabilized, as I recall. Uh, they're actually gravity, gravity gradient stabilized. So if you have a, another picture on the others. So you can see here, let's see, can I draw on this? Yeah. So actually they're gravity gradient stabilized, meaning that uh, uh, they're always, so they, they got this thing here. It's a, it's a big weight and it uh, makes sure that the, this antenna here is always pointing towards the earth. But the radial orientation of the spacecraft doesn't matter, right? So they're designed so that they'll always, you know, uh, have solar because it's, they've got this drum design, so they always have solar. And so as long as they're pointing towards the Earth, right, uh, they, that's, that's accurate enough for these spacecraft, right? So their mission is communication relay, uh, low pointing accuracy. Um, so this is a this was a 1985 satellite, so that's relatively recent. Um, there are old ones, uh, so in particular, uh, the the Australias are perhaps best known not only for military communications and being gravity gradient stabilized, uh, but for causing the largest uh, disaster in space to date, which was the 2009 collision between an Iridium satellite and a uh, Australia satellite. Now, I won't say that's what caused the Iridium bankruptcy, but uh, it certainly didn't, didn't help their image at that point. Uh, so there was, a, uh, there was a collision between a, uh, an Australia 2M satellite and an Iridium number 33 uh, in 2009. Uh, at, I believe, uh, it was uh, 7 uh, the altitude of intact was 789, which is the orbit of, a, of an iridium. So it's the correct orbit for iridium, uh, but it's not the correct orbit for Australia. You notice Australia's are in a higher orbit, or supposed to be in a higher orbit. Right. Uh, this one had been dead for some time. Um, so the satellite was dead, had, been, had died in 1995 and was uh, most likely just decaying, and it had decayed down from 14, 1,400 kilometers, oops, it's the wrong one, uh, down from 1,400 kilometers down to 780. Um, and the impact, when these two collided, uh, they, were, they, were, they were going relatively fast. Well, they were both going relatively fast, uh, but they weren't going at the impact velocity, which was 11.7 kilometers per second, right? So, you know, a gnat hits you at 11.7 kilometers per second, it'll pass right through you, right? So how could they possibly be going at 11.7 kilometers per second when actually the, the, the velocity of an orbit at 789, I believe is only like, I wanna say seven kilometers per second, right? For, you, you can just do mu over r and figure that out. Well, of course, the, the the thing is, they were both in um, they were both in inclined orbits, right? Australia was, a, it was about the same inclination as uh, so. It has got Australia's eighty two degree inclination, 
this iridium, I believe, was 66, 82 degrees. And it was hit at, they combined at the, uh, essentially what the ascending node for iridium and the descending node for the Australia satellite. And uh, of course, right, the relative velocity vector, because there were some direct, some components of the iridium velocity parallel to the, to the Australia. And so the impact velocity was actually 11.7 .7 kilometers per second, very high. And of course, this, uh, this, uh, this caused a big kerfuffle because right, parts of the Iridium and the Australia satellite then dispersed over, right, uh, not just in their orbital plane, but all over sort of this mean velocity vector. Right. And so created all sorts of space junk. Posing, of course, hazards for uh, other spacecraft. Now, it's at 789 kilometers, right? Altitude, 789 kilometers. And if you go back to our lecture, was it 11 or, so, or 12? Uh, you can look up what for, space junk has a relatively low ballistic coefficient. Right? And so you can look up how long that space chunk would be expected to live at an altitude of 789 kilometers. Um, so probably most of this space chunk has re-entered at this point. It's been 10 years, 11 years. Uh, so most of that's probably re-entered. But there's probably still a bunch out there because, uh, you know, that's the mean, right? And because of this really high uh, impact, Right, probably some of that space junk was ejected into higher orbit. And so, why would that be? Well, you could think of like uh, the uh, this uh, the impact of the of the Australia or the Iridium spacecraft being like a uh, a mass boost to the uh, the Australia spacecraft, or vice versa. Right? So they could be launched into higher orbit. All right, so uh, almost uh, almost done here with the, uh, the the survey of spacecraft mission design. Uh, I thought we'd do something uh, more modern, uh, the Starlink constellation here, uh, because this is in the news. Uh, so this is sort of the modern version of Iridium, the new Iridium, if you will. And, uh, so the idea is uh, we want, except for the, this is for the internet. And so the idea is, uh, right, you know how the internet works now, right? Uh, you're in the US, here's Europe, if you will. Here's China, if you'd like, right? How do we communicate with these countries now? Well, we have fiber optic links. fiber optic link to Europe, got a fiber optic link to, to China. Uh, the downside, of course, of fiber optics is the speed of light in glass is uh, slower than that of the speed of light in vacuum. Right? And so the idea is, right, if you, instead of passing your packet through a fiber optic link, uh, you instead bounce it off into space, hit a satellite, bounce it to another satellite, bounce it to another satellite, and sent it back to the Earth. That would be faster, less latency, than uh, if you uh, sent it through the fiber optic link. So actually, not only are these, is this supposed to be a system for um, uh, reliable communication anywhere on Earth, reli reliable internet anywhere on Earth,
but it's also supposed to be faster internet. Right? There's acknowledgments, ping acknowledgments get sent back faster. Anyway, but to do this, right, you've got to have relatively fast communication between satellites. Um, and uh, they, satellites can't be too far above the Earth's surface. So the estimate, I, I don't know why we need quite this many satellites, but the estimate of the number of satellites that they're going to launch in the first phase is 1,584. And if you go to the Wikipedia entry, right, it'll tell you how many are in the second phase, which is about planned to be 12,000 satellites. And so this, this satellite system is supposed to essentially replace the fiber optic connections we have on Earth. So we'll see, see how that goes. Certainly possible in some areas that it would be uh, faster. Uh, I don't know about the bandwidth though, we'll see. Anyway, uh, there's currently 350 of them floating around. Uh, that's uh, as of April. Uh, they're all at 53 inclination. You see that 53 inclination popping up again there, right? This is a very popular one for these uh, satellite constellations because, right, it covers most of the Earth, right, for the, through various right ascensions, and it skips the poles, skips the North Pole. So these, you'll see, uh, the, there's no coverage for these satellites at the North Pole. but no one cares uh, other than Santa Claus. And I don't think any of the Santa Claus is bringing many presents to Elon Musk anyway. So you know, just saying. Uh, the satellites themselves are relatively small. They're not quite CubeSats, but they're relatively small. They're 500, 600 pounds currently. Uh, the altitude is 550 kilometers, which is relatively small. They actually meant to be 1000 kilometers, but they lowered it to 550. Uh, ostensibly about uh, for reasons of uh, electromagnetic interference, but also because they got sued by OneWeb, which had a pl similar plan. Because the OneWeb claimed like the 1100 kilometer altitude. Uh, so you notice, of course, they're at 550 kilometers. So there's uh, some, obviously there has to be some station keeping involved. Uh, the mission, uh, so station keeping, right, meaning they have to, there's atmospheric drag, right? Uh, and so to counter the atmospheric drag, you remember what we talked about, they have ion thrusters. And, uh, you know, these, uh, these ion thrusters uh, are relatively efficient, so you don't have to carry too much fuel on them. They have this pizza board shape, so the uh, design of the spacecraft looks approximately like this. Now you've got your solar panel up here. You've got uh, essentially the, a flat design here, a flat design weighing 600 pounds. Um, obviously, there's not much symmetry here. I guess you could, if you sliced it that way, Right, there's a plane of symmetry, maybe that way it's a plane of symmetry. So it's not too bad, uh, but uh, remember these are communication satellites. They have to maintain links with the other satellites. That's actually the, the hard part here. Uh, laser links between satellites. And so a uh, high pointing accuracy is required. Uh, so the uh, so the high pointing actually three axis stabilize they use reaction wheels uh, to achieve that um, and they use star trackers which are the gold standard of, of ACDS for orientation right. so uh, very uh, sophisticated satellite uh, I believe this is the uh, HET here uh, you don't see the uh, the reaction wheels because they're inside the, the spacecraft um, so if we go to the next page. Right, so here's the HET, Hall Effect Thruster, Ion Thruster. Uh, uses uh, Krypton gas, uh, as ion thrusters do. Um, 
for station keeping. I don't know what the lifetime on these spacecraft is, so they're not exactly saying. This is a star tracker. These are the reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are typically used for high uh, accuracy uh, pointing requirements. So that's what we see here. Oh, and uh, here we can we go to the link. We can uh, see the... Uh, May 2019, uh, SpaceX mute now. Uh, I think if we go to... Here we go. Uh, do, do, do. No. Yeah, there's the uh, satellite constellation. You see uh, here, right, on these... Uh, these circles, those are the coverage areas for each satellite. And so the, uh, the, uh, there, there's a coverage area for, uh, for a bunch of satellites over North America, for example. And they, uh, they're, they're supposed to relay the information from the user to the satellite to another satellite to another user, right? The same way the internet works, right? This distributed uh, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm-based um, approach for routing. So we'll see how well that works in the end. Not up and running quite yet. Right. So finally, uh, last example here of uh, mission design, the, uh, the Viking spacecraft. This is the uh, mission to Mars, right? So we talked about interplanetary mission planning last time. Uh, it has uh, essentially two planes of symmetry, right there and there. Slice it two different ways, you can get symmetry. Uh, its mission is uh, photography, essentially. But there's a couple others. Uh, communication with the Earth. You need to maintain communication with the Earth at all times. And finally, uh, it actually has a lander. Um, that's the... Uh, the lander right there. Um, it uh, it was launched into inserted into Mars orbit, and the orbit initial orbit was uh, three twenty by fifty six thousand kilometers. This may look familiar from interplanetary mission planning. This is the uh, uh, this corresponds to the minimum delta v needed for injection. So it doesn't do a flyby. So you could probably calculate based on the last lecture, the delta V requirements for the spacecraft, right? Uh, it's got a thruster, of course, right? Not a big one, there it is, though. Uh, it has to be three axis stabilized because it has communication and photography requirements. Um, here's a camera. And uh, here's the link. Yep. Notice if it was just the uh, the lander, uh, it's possible it could get away with uh, with just uh, a rotational uh, stability and the attitude, but uh, because of the communication and photography, it's three axis stable, stabilized. Uh, Thirty nine degrees inclination, uh, eccentricity, high, highly eccentric orbit. Uh, so a little history of the uh, Viking spacecraft. There were two of them, of course, both going to Mars. Uh, their first one Mar uh, inserted on uh, 1976. Um, the, uh, uh, it only lasted a little while, uh, until 1980, four years. But it, it didn't immediately die, so that's, that's always positive. Um, it was designed to last uh, till 2019, but something happened, and we don't know what ha where it is right now. It's, it's perhaps still floating around Mars, but, uh, but it might have also decayed. We don't know. Uh, the Viking 2, actually, uh, uh, remember, it, it's three-axis stabilized, uh, mostly through thrusters. Um, so the ACDS, Attitude Dynamics and Control System, developed a... a, a, a uh, a propulsion leak, right? Uh, so a thruster, that means. It was using a thruster. Uh, and was uh, because of that, it was shut down in 1978, so it didn't last very long. 
Uh, this uh, Viking one was the actually the land uh, did a soft landing on Mars successfully. Uh, it was not the first, however. Uh, the U.S. the Soviet Union beat us again, right? Uh, they beat us with Sputnik, and they beat us uh, to Mars, right? So the uh, the first uh, first spacecraft to land on on Mars was Soviet, uh, the Mars three spacecraft. Uh, it 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 did manage to land on Mars. Uh, it, it only lasted about 20 seconds, however, um, so it landed and, uh, and, and, com and did communicate, ping, ping, ping back to the spacecraft, um, landed on Mars, ping, to the orbiter, and then ping, back to Earth, but only did that for 20 seconds, and that's probably because it had really bad timing, uh, there was a, a big dust storm blowing by, and probably it got knocked over. Uh, in that dust storm or something else tore loose or something that happened but it only lasted 20 seconds but it's still technically first spacecraft to successfully land on mars softly uh, so we were the second viking all right so we've uh we've talked a little bit about mission design uh, mission requirements for spacecraft uh, sort of their pointing needs, attitude, uh, need for attitude control systems. Um, obviously, attitude control and dynamics is not the you know the sexiest part of uh, of uh, orbital uh, uh, of spacecraft, or, or but uh, but in fact uh, is essential uh, to uh, um, is essential to, to the mission. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the solutions next for the attitude, dynamics, and control systems. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to break the video here so uh, you can take a break and maybe pick up the rest of the lecture at a later time because I have a small change in subject here.